Hello everybody, my name is Louisette Lantang and I want to share with you some of the games my parents used to play as Acadians in Karakut, New Brunswick. Uh, this is a community that was uh, not the same as the French Quebec or the, the English uh, communities because the language had isolated them somewhat. Uh, they spoke different dialect. Um, it was a village of about 35 families who founded the place, uh, integrated with Mi'kmaq, and uh, we were a Métis people. And uh, the interesting thing is, is the games that they used to play, they had to innovate themselves. There was nothing of store-bought game. So they created everything that they had uh, to pass the time with. So I'll talk to you about the games as my parents had told me, what they used to play with, how they used to do it. Um, one of the things that was a big love early on was skating. Because uh, in Bas Caraquet, Lower Caraquet area, uh, otherwise known as Saint-Simon, uh, they used to have ice all over the place in the winter. It was not a matter of snow plow and shoveling and all that stuff. It was a matter of living in an area where sometime it would freeze so much that you could literally skate to and from the school using your skates, if you had skates. And the interesting thing was not everybody had skates, so they knew how to fabricate their own. And what they used to do was they used to take these big can that had the metal about that big circle, and then they would hammer down the middle of the can to make it flat, just enough to put your foot inside the can and the rim of the can would become the skate that you could use. So they used to fabricate their own skates made out of cans to create a double bladed metal edge that was worn at the bottom of the shoe that you could skate. So that was one of the, the homemade games that they had. Um, another homemade game that they had was um, this this game that my mother explained to me. What they did was they took a, a piece of wood and then they put a nail at the end of the nail. But they took the nail and they would hammer it flat so it became like a blade. So what you essentially have is like a cylinder type, let's say about this size, right? So this would be the wood, the rest would be the flattened nail. And she said the floorboards of the attic and in the house was made of... Um, pine, which is a soft wood. And these are in the rooms, not the good rooms of the house, but the room that were like uh, the one you would dry corn in or do your spinning in, uh, all of the, 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 the work like that. So in my parents' house, the attic was that space that they used to play in in the winter with the, with the soft wood lumber floor made of the pine. So they took this wood with a flat nail on top and they played this game and they put it on the back of the hand like this and my mom says the object of the game was to flip it where the blade lodges into the wood upright so it's basically a dart game and so they begin with the hands they would go like this and then flip it off to get it so that the dart points straight up off the floor that was considered one point and she said this is how they played it they threw it from here to there they did the other hand from there to there, and then they go on the elbow like this, flick it off to the dart stick. Other elbow, flick it off to the dart stick. Then she said they used to cross the arm and do the shoulder, flick it off to the dart stick. Flick it off to the dart sticks. And then they had this last one where they held it on the forehead and they flick it off until the dart sticks. So by the end of the winter, I'm sure you had a hole full of floor, uh, or a floor full of holes. <laughs> and uh, that's how the kids pass the time. And nothing like a little bit of, um, you know, tetanus to make the winter go by. <laughs> I don't know how they did it without getting it in their foot. But uh, these are the games of children. <laughs> Another game that they had was a variant. Uh, well, I don't I don't actually know. I'm, I'm kind of wondering whether or not the... Uh, the indigenous created the game uh, cricket, but my parents never called it as such. And this is how they used to play the game. Okay, so they created the ball from the hemp of the fishing line and they tied it, tied it super tight till it was really dense. And then 
they they with some time capture uh, captured this ball inside a, a wrap of leather. Okay, so you have the leather from the pig, and they would sew and stitch it to protect this hemp, right? So they essentially made a baseball from the hemp of the fishing rope and the leather that they had. And then with this ball, what they did was they had a game where one guy has like a plank, a bat made like a plank, and then they had two points. Okay, it's, just, it's basically the game cricket, right? They had two points and then they hit the ball and then they have to go between those two points before the ball is returned and, and the guy stops running. My parents never knew the word cricket. The name of this game as they played it was called Monte de Sound. Okay, Monte de Sound. Because you would climb to go to the other point and then you would descend to go back from where the ball was hit. Monte de Sound. And I got the story from both my mom and my dad through two separate conversations. And then I told my mom, I said, do you realize that that's the game cricket? And she said, what's cricket? Okay, she's 84 years old, never heard the word cricket. Okay, she doesn't, she doesn't know the game. They had no context. They were an isolated community in the middle of New Brunswick. And they were playing that game for God knows how long. They always played that game. She's, she's 80, 84 years old right now. My dad is, uh, is in his late 80s. And it's the same thing. Like, uh, how does that happen? Where did that come from? Where did that influence come from? Because the English never played with us. We didn't have integration with the English community in New Brunswick so much because we were pariahs to them. We were indigenous and we were French Acadian and there was no mixing of the two. And so the question is, where did this game come from? How did it get there? It's one of those mysteries. In another game that they used to play, a game with the hemp ball. The hemp was the ball for many games. They wound it tight and then they had this little tiny ball. And then they would take a piece of almost two by four, so a, a block of wood and then they create a hole for a dowel that they put into the wood and they would hit the ball with this dowel and it was basically golf. It was the easiest way to say it. They played golf using these little hemp balls, the two by four little bit and then this dowel that was in it and that was how they played in Acadia. Okay, there was no golf course for them. There was certainly no money for it, and we didn't have anything like that around us at the time. These were games that they had for a long time. Where did these games come from? Who took it? Where did it go? How are these things done? And I have to wonder. Uh, another game which got me thinking a lot is that when they slaughtered the pig, Okay, a pig is a very big animal. When they slaughtered these animals, the children would wait outside the slaughterhouse for the bladder of the pig. That was the coveted golden item from the pig that any kid would wait for. And as soon as they were done gutting the pig, that bladder would go to the kids, who would then blow up the bladder, tie it with the sinew, and let it dry. Okay, so the pig bladder was dry and it became a ball, a ball sealed with air. And that pig skin was used as their football. It was used as their volleyball. And this was their ball. And it was the way that they made their toys. And it was not a thing that at all seems, um, I mean, this they were they later called the game with the football pig skin, right? It was literally pig skin, is how they fabricated the toy. So, I have to wonder if the indigenous people were at the root of discovering these games more so than the Europeans. Okay, like the European took a lot of products that we created and, and they 
used it. And we had a trade with the Europeans in 1610. So, I mean, obviously there was an exchange of ideas happening there. The game ended up, this, this game, Monte de Sound, is the same one that they played in India. And the English were a link of that. And then we have this golf game. My parents had no access to golf course. So where would they know of this concept? So we don't know where do these games actually originate. Were they North American games that were fabricated to create a European game? Or was it vice versa? Were we influenced by European game to create these things? I don't know. It's a very interesting thing, but not a lot of people take a gut and turn it into a ball unless that was the way. And it, for us, it was always the way we did these things as indigenous people. And um, another thing that, uh, another game that they used to play, uh, let me think. Hockey. Okay, hockey was fun. Now the hockey stick for sure was a Mi'kmaq invention. We know that. We know that one. Because the wood of it was specific to the lands where we lived. In other words, uh, to find a tree, you would, my parents told me this, because they made their own hockey stick. Okay, like they knew how to do the job. And what you do is you go to where the cliffs are along the beach and you look for the ash trees that are bent like that. You know how the tree arcs towards the sun on the end of a cliff? Okay, those little arky like bends are the hockey stick. They carved the stick from those bends because in the day they did not have the steaming of the wood the same. Okay, the steaming of the wood was a later invention and we didn't have the luxury of those things. So we literally look for the hockey stick bend in the tree itself, okay? And the way that we found trees was by praying for them. <laughs> so, for example, if you're building a boat or a hockey stick or whatever, you have to be aware of God giving you that tree, okay? There was a prayer in a sense, and you look for a sign, and you look for that tree, the tree that speaks. And it could be a bird call, it could be a squirrel call, it could be the way the breeze blows that lets you know, ah, there's your tree, take it, it's for you. Okay, so those were the way that we had. And that was how my grandfathers built all their boats out of the wood, it was the same thing. So you look for these trees given. And another thing sometimes they used to do was uh, to help the bend of the wood. Like in order to have a good hockey stick, you not only have to cut it like, like an L shape, there was this nice little kind of a curvy effect towards the end of the blade and stuff. And what they used to do sometime was let the wood uh, bend by leaning it up or, or shaping it over time. Like there were some trees that give a little uh, by way of just allowing the gravity to help form the wood. <laughs> There was this way that they had. Anyhow, so yeah, my parents were big hockey fan, big skating fan, because they were surrounded with the ice in the winter. And um, the uh, hockey, of course, requires a puck. But back in the day, we did not have access to things like uh, the rubber and the, the puck as such. So they used what they had around them. And a lot of these hockey pucks were the gift of the cow. <laughs> yes, they used cow turd. Frozen cow turd as the hockey puck. And it was a thing. <laughs> and that's what they had to use. It was a good texture. It was frozen. It, it gave a good clack when you smack it. And it, you could get about the right size. <laughs> so, yeah, you know. <laughs> Uh, if you have a hockey puck today, be thankful because the older options were not quite as nice. Eh? But yeah, I mean, they, that was a thing. Um, you know, you make do with what you have. So uh, another thing that the, they used to do uh, for playing was tire. If anyone ever had a tire, that was gold because, I mean, nobody had cars back then. <laughs> it was like there was one village car that they really used and that was owned by my grandfather to bring people to and from the, the doctor, and it was used by the parish priest, and that was the, the community car. Um, so the tire was a coveted thing. 
and the way that they play with the tire was by putting a kid on the inside of the tire and pushing it <laughs> so the kid would be inside getting dizzy while this thing's rolling along and that's uh, you know he'd take it for a spin eh? <laughs> and uh yeah it's kind of crazy the things they used to do um of course you can make tire swings and my grandma used to garden with tires like she was smart about her gardening because she thought well this makes sense right you take the tire and you put your plants in it and when you water the water stays contained in that so you don't need as much water to you know get your flowers blooming and whatnot so tires were never thrown out nothing was thrown out in Acadia these things are always reused um, well, another thing uh, my parents used to do was uh, play with the farm animals because they enjoy the farm animals. But uh, like my dad, uh, oh yeah, he used to like, okay, so the things like bicycle were extremely rare. You, you might have one bike in the family and you had like about 10 kids. That was the situation with my dad. He was the second youngest of 10 kids, one single bicycle for all of them. And being the second youngest, he used to have to wake up at like five in the morning, six in the morning to have his turn to ride the bike because during the day there was not a chance all of his older brothers and sisters would take this thing to go visit their friends and he didn't have a chance to ride it. So my dad tells me of how he used to wake up early in the morning just to have his turn to ride the bicycle. And that was a big thing like I mean just to have one was golden and like these were treasures that were passed down from family to family we never ever uh, would discard a bike that was like a that was a vehicle that was a necessity that was a tool it was uh, it was a highly prized item uh, bicycles were like gold because there was no money for cars no and and I mean these are tools right um, Let's see. Uh, oh, my father uh, sometime would go to the movies and watch these cowboy show, Roy Rogers and whatnot. Like he grew up with those cowboy movies and it was awful because here he is an indigenous guy watching movies about white guys uh, shooting red guys, right? And even some of these Roy Rogers songs you hear are so racist against indigenous people, you know? But my dad, there was something about these movies that it had enough indigenous culture it was attractive to them but on the same note it was also this horrible dichotomy of these are also movies feeding the ideas of genocide against your people so it the idea of uh, the the movies from my dad the cowboy film was a love hate thing because he loved the movies he loved the west he loved the stories of the the land and the people and just the lifestyle and yet it broke his heart to see the demonization of indigenous people all the time it was a sad part but on the same note he admired some of the values like they they stole values indigenous uh for the sake of the cowboy value like Roy Rogers was one who preached the values of, of the cowboy value system right and they were all a lot of these ideas were gleaned from indigenous people too it was expropriation and it was crazy because uh, like I said my dad saw threads of things he could identify with in these characters that were also shooting our people and it was it's weird eh anyhow my dad used to wake up and uh, want to ride a horse, but we never had horses the same. Like uh, we had a, an old nag. Uh, she was like a sway back thing. She was so old, but she was a farm animal that would help us with the, the tilling and things like that. Um, but my dad wanted to ride a horse like uh, Roy Rogers and his heroes in the movies. So what he ended up doing was riding his family cow because <laughs> there was no horse in his family and that was the only cow, you know horseish looking thing so when he was a kid he used to ride the cow around and pretend it was a horse it was a big thing for him and uh yeah um my parents spent a lot of their recreational time playing in the bush um eating things like bunch berries and blueberries and strawberries everybody picked berries 
Uh, another fun thing they used to do was uh, go play by the beach and make uh, fires and cook the food right on the beach using the using a pit like they did a fire pit and then they, they cook their their fish on top of sticks and stuff like that and, and they would eat right off the beach it was fun um, another way that they used to pass the time was uh, would they would spin the wool and things like that I remember helping my aunt card the 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 wool like this and then I remember taking the burrs out of the little pieces of fluff that were used and then handing it the little tufts of them that you could spin on the on the wheel and they made their own textiles and fabrics and my grandma used to use this wool to uh, on a big giant loom to make her blankets and she used this material to knit socks and everybody had those cornrow slippers everywhere you went you would be offered a pair of cornrow slippers because back in the day uh, the the houses did not have like the carpets like they have today it was all these kind of tile floor type or a cold floor and you would always be offered a pair of cornrow slipper my mom uh, tells me back then that the women used to have two dresses uh, they had a, an outer dress and an inner dress and they were almost like apron I guess you could say one was like for travel and you could get the dust and dirt on but once you arrived to the place of destination you could take off that outer dress and have the inner dress to wear so they were almost like an apron type concept uh, one of my aunts used to wear a lot of those and uh, yeah that was the way um, they love dancing too and my mom told me this beautiful story about um, her and her husband-to-be uh, when they were kids. Now she explains it this way. Her house is here on one side of the street and in the front of the street there's like a little bit of a bush uh, and they were they had made a whole bunch of fresh barrels. The barrels are used for shipping and they were beautiful wooden big barrels that had the rings to hold them and uh, what happened was my uncles brought all these fresh barrels and to the woods they made that it was a nice clearing and they created like a circle of barrels and there was an inner space and that inner space was used for people to dance and my mom was a little girl at the time and my uh, uncle I think it was Manonk Simon uh, my, my mom's brother who would sing songs and the local kids got together inside this little nest of barrels and they danced together and they were imitating the, the adults dancing at the house and parties and such and that's what they did in the bush in their little makeshift ballroom they did these little dances and my mom was about uh, seven years old and my dad was about 12 years old and uh, he saw her and thought she was sweet and so he asked her to dance and my mom remembers dancing with my dad for the first time in this little outdoorsy barrel ballroom and she was holding him like this because he was so tall and he was teaching her how to dance and it was really cute but she fell in love with him then that's what she said she tells the story to me last time I visited her and you should have seen the look on her face. It was just beautiful. She says, I remember when he asked me to dance and I was dancing with him. I just looked at him and I thought, he's so nice. I could marry him one day. I really could marry him one day. And she did. She actually did. She was seven. He was like around 12. And uh, yeah, it was cute. Eh? <laughs> So those are the stories of my parents. Uh, yeah, I was seven, eight years old and a 12 year old eh? dancing away in the bush. And uh, yeah, so they lived happily ever after. <laughs> Been together now for over 60 years, married. Yeah, and that was their childhood. Anyway, so I wanted to share these little gems with you and let you know that uh, we were playing with balls, we were playing with hockey sticks, we were playing a football-like game, we were playing volleyball-like games, we were playing a, a monte de sand, which is a, a, like cricket. Um, and that was all happening in Acadia, and that happened, well, that my mom is 80, 
84, my dad's older. <laughs> so, I mean, hey, hey, it was a long time ago, but that's what was happening. And there was no TV, no radio. Uh, well, they had the radio growing up, but there was no TV back in the day. So, I mean, how they got the accuracy of these sports is beyond me, because at the time there was no integration with the English. So, it's kind of a cool, uh, cool history to know. So, that's about it. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.